OU UCF on Saturday. Let's start on the defensive side of the ball for the Sooners. What are you watching for from OU's defense against UCF's offense? Well, the most interesting storyline, I guess, coming into this is quarterback. Um, what's John Rice Plumley going to look like? Um, you know, they said he's going to get the start. Uh, does he play the whole game? He's got a knee issue going on. They tried to bring him back against Kansas, did not go well. Um, he's had some time since then. I don't think he's going to be close to himself, which we only saw a, a brief flash of that this season, and he looked pretty good. Uh, he can run around. He can make some plays. Um, but he's not a pocket quarterback. He needs access to all of his athleticism to to really be, uh, you know, what they want him to be. So that's the main thing to watch. Now, as far as what you're going to get from their offense, I say that this is responsibility football week. You are going to get a bunch of different concepts. You're going to get a bunch of different window dressing with motions and misdirection and zone read and option and RPOs, it's it's a big mix of everything. Um, you know, it's interesting, starting in the run game, you're going to see traditional just split zone. Back in the, uh, in the shotgun next to the quarterback, uh, a tight end, offset, off of the ball, H-back, coming across the formation, traditional split zone. But then they'll do reverse split zone where the tight end comes like from the backside to the front side it's a weird play i don't know why people do it but um you'll get that from them you'll get the split zone read where the quarterback is reading the defensive end to see if he's going to keep it and sometimes he'll keep it and then they'll throw the bubble off of that as well. So you'll have like, there's, it's like triple new age, triple option. Running back has a chance to keep it. Quarterback has a chance to keep it. And then he'll throw the bubble on the outside. Um, they'll also do the reverse zone read where the quarterback is now faking the, they do it out of jet sweep a lot. He's faking the jet sweep reading the edge and he may give it to the jet sweep around the corner or he may keep it and they'll run it up the middle and they'll usually run some type of center or guard pull and fold on the inside if the quarterback's going to keep it on the inside um you'll get some stuff out of bunch i expect to see some bunch with this group um you'll get some stuff out of bunch um you know, whenever you've got bunch, you've got access to the split zone, really all of the same stuff, but it starts in a bunch formation and they will do some end around stuff and like ghost motion out of bunch. Um, now you'll, you'll get sprint pass and off of sprint pass, they run the old school smoke draw or sprint draw where, you know, the quarterback looks backs offset, let's say to the right quarterback takes a snap and it looks like sprint pass. He's going to sprint out back takes like a half a step and then just freezes and the quarterback runs by him and sticks it in his gut and he comes back kind of across the grain and it's weird how the offensive line blocks it they do this thing where they just turn sideways it it's weird it's also stupid <laughs> I, really I am it. I'm a big sprint draw guy I think it's an incredibly effective play their ball handling on it is really good I don't understand why they block it that way I'm just I Someone's going to have to explain that to me. It's it's old, and so they they try to get you to cross their face, and they will you. So it's it's really weird. Um, what's it's what's funny about it is Alabama ran that against us in two thousand two when they came to Norman, and whenever we were preparing for the game, we had like we had a bunch of like discussion on how to how to play it and then finally coach venables is like just when you see it just go just 
fly through the first gap you see, which is not typically how we fit things. It's all like very schematically sound. And we did that, and I had like three or four tackles for loss in that game, so I loved it. But the interesting thing, we stole that and ran it against Texas that year, and that's the year Quentin Griffin had like a huge year running that smoke draw play. So that's kind of an interesting little backstory. But you'll see that, I mean, once, maybe twice a game, if that. Um, they'll run counter. Um they ran outside zone with the wipe, Gabe. Did you see that play where the center wipes around the backside? So that was pretty interesting. Um, but really, to me, it's all about responsibility football. Play your gap. I think the offensive line is solid, not great. Um, if we maintain gap integrity, play what we're supposed to do, I think we should do well. I think the two backs are actually really good. Um, Seven, Harvey is powerful. He runs low. He's got good balance and leg churn. Uh, Richardson is the fastback. Took an 80-yarder on the first play of the game against Baylor on a little jet outside concept. They do like a – he'll start in the backfield and looks like he's going to motion out to empty. He takes like three or four steps and then stops and then comes flying back across so they get kind of a jet concept with the running back. Um, but he's fast and impressive. Uh, to me, we should really do a good job against this offense. The kind of flyer or the thing that has me questioning is how, what does Plumlee look like? If he's able to run around, scramble, um, you know, make plays down the field in the in the scramble drill, then I think that would be the way that they have success because the passing game appears to me that other than like sprint pass, uh, they'll do some like little screen stuff, like a swing screen to the back or a, a, a Y screen on action away. Other than that, it's almost exclusively matchup go balls with an over route underneath it. That's a, that's about all you're going to get from in the passing game. And it's, it's, they'll do some of the stuff. If you'll remember Baylor, whenever Baylor would go match up, this is old school Baylor match up and go balls. Everyone else will just kind of stand there and watch. They've come to the line. They've identified where they're going with it. That's our matchup. And everyone else just kind of stands there and watches. They'll do that as well. So it's going to be difficult for them to find a matchup that they like. They do have some good speed at wide receiver. Hudson uh, is a leading receiver. He's a transfer from Auburn. And then uh, Baker is a transfer for Alabama. So they've got some SEC players at wide receiver. But as far as concepts, they're not going to give you a bunch of different route tree combinations. It's, it's all matchups. So I happen to like our matchups. So I think that's going to be a difficult game for them. I'm with you. I think it's very similar to the conversation we have a lot of times with a mobile quarterback. And you're right. John Rice Plumlee, he's not going to be himself. When he's healthy, he can go. Mm -hmm. Like He's fast, fast. But that knee clearly, clearly is not healthy. But it, it's the same goal. Make him play from the pocket. Yeah. Make him beat you throwing the football. Making tough accurate throws in tight windows. If you can do that, you're going to be just fine. I am looking forward to you losing your mind when they throw an RPO, when both guards are blocking both inside backers. I cannot wait. It is good yeah. because they do it. They've got some RPO stuff in their system and they like to throw that slant in behind the backers. And I've seen it multiple times on tape where both inside backers have their hands up trying to deflect the slant the and they are chest. being engaged by <laughs> offensive linemen. And I cannot well, wait for you to freak out on the broadcast as a result of that. Yeah. Um, and I, I failed to mention the RPO game. Um, we, it's interesting. They do. And this isn't exclusive to UCF, but it's the rare RPO where the quarterback will turn here 
and he's reading the safety on the backside, and he'll pull it and throw the slant away from where the exchange is. Um, you don't see that one nearly as much, but they do that one. They do that one quite a bit. It's it's a routine play for them, and you know, just listening to Coach Venables talk about it on Monday night at Rudy's, I he, he thinks that the RPO game is much more fluid and efficient with Plumley at the helm, which I mean makes sense, but like that's one of the main benefits of getting him back, even if he's not full go scrambling and running around and using his full speed, just kind of the efficiency running some of those those key schemes that they have should be better. I think I think OU is going to give up some big plays in this game just because they've had an extra week to prepare. Malzahn's really creative. Yeah. They're going to have some stuff where you go, okay, that was really good. But the key is that those plays that they hit you on aren't, you know, catastrophic, yeah. right? They're not big, long touchdowns. And, and I know that Venables will have the defense ready to roll. But the only other thing I have after watching the tape of UCF's offense is our safeties and corners are going to need to get off blocks and tackle well. Yeah, They have so many concepts that attack what I call the alley in the defense. So safeties, and they've got guys with speed, right? Townsend, number three, he looks he looks like a poor man's Tyreek Hill. Like when you see the way he moves and his body type, you're like, that could be Tyreek Hill's cousin, Like is kind of how I view it. And then Richardson, zero. Right, you mentioned his big playability. The stuff that they do with both of those guys to attack the alleys with speed sweeps, different concepts, they really force your defensive backs to come up and make plays. And so far this season, OU's defensive backs have done a really good job in those situations. They need to continue to do a really good job against this team because they do have a couple guys that they're going to get the ball on the edges to that can hurt you if you miss tackles. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, one last thing in, I don't know if you heard Venables talk about this on the, on the Rudy show, but you know, the SMU game, there's a lot of similarities and carryover. Um, you know, they tried, cause you mentioned all the, the gadgets and stuff you may see from Mulzahn with the creativity. SMU tried a bunch of that stuff against Oklahoma. And that was kind of a good tune-up. Rhett Lashley played quarterback for Gus Malzahn. He was his offensive coordinator at Auburn. So there's a lot of similarities and carryover between those two offenses. And that's definitely the approach that Lashley took. So, yeah, throwbacks, uh, kind of hidden wheel routes on the backside, um, away from the action, maybe some throwback, throwback screen stuff. Um, maybe double pass misdirection on like that zone read where you throw the bubble, you could get double pass or something off of that. So that is a good point um, that you're going to have to have your antenna up with all of the misdirection and stuff happening that they're going to try and sneak something out on you. Anything else that's you're it. watching for? All right, let's talk about what we're watching for from OU's offense versus UCF's defense. Wanted to start here. And Jeff Levy would never say this. This one is personal for him. I believe. Mm -hmm. He hasn't told me that. He hasn't said it publicly. But I firmly believe he thought he was going to be the head football coach at UCF. And they ended up going with Malzahn instead. I don't think there's a game that Jeff Lebby wants to light up the scoreboard more than this game. I think it's very personal for him, right? And I think there were a lot of people around that program, within that program, that thought he was going to be the next head coach at UCF. So that's just one thing to keep in mind as we head into this football game. Looking at UCF's defense, I see UCF as a 4-2-5 team. Uh, Traymond Morris Brash, who's got some good numbers. When you look at you, know, you look at the stats, he's labeled as their buck. He's just a defensive end that plays standing up. That's what he is. 
And with OU being a team that majors in 11 personnel, right? One back, one tight end. You're mostly going to see an even front, right? So two guys on the line of scrimmage on each side of the center. Now they have shown the ability to jump into odd spacing and Morris Brash is still just standing up. So it'll look like a three-man front with an overhang player, number three. But when I watch their defense, I do not think UCF has the defensive personnel to line up, keep things simple, play straight, and hold up against OU's offense. I, I, I think their defensive line is solid. I, I think they're a physical group. I just don't think they're overly talented. I think they're going to have to do some things. I think they're going to have to slant and angle their front. Uh, I think they're going to need to dial up some pressure, Ted. So part of game planning for this game for OU's offensive staff and those players, I, I think they're going to have to do some guessing what those pressure packages could look like because I just do not see UCF lining up saying, all right, let's get this on. We're going to play straight. I just, I don't see him holding up that way. Yeah. Well, you would hope that they couldn't, they shouldn't be able to, um, if we're legitimately a, you know, top five football team going up against a team that's just now coming to the first power five conference, like that, that is exactly how it should be, right? They should have to do some things against you to try and even things out a little bit. Um, and we've got smart coaches. They know that. And whenever you have to get aggressive defensively and take some risks, you're giving up something on the back end. All right? you, can't just, you can't just add players to the mix, add things to the mix without giving something up. And our coaches have to, you know, they'll have a game plan of what they think is going to happen and how they're going to take advantage of it. Um, there may also be where they're in the game and once they see what it is they're going to do, you kind of adjust on the fly and find a way to to really expose their aggressiveness. So I, that should yield some very explosive plays for Oklahoma. I'm with you. Okay, some run game thoughts. First and foremost, what's OU's offensive line going to look like? I haven't talked to anyone, so this is not any inside knowledge. I, I just look at this situation and think, what would I do if it was up to me? What makes the most sense? Uh, Matoyer is going to miss some time, right? That was, a, that was a bad ankle injury. So I believe... It's time, right, until Matoyer is back, it's time to get your most talented five guys on the field. And when I look at that group, I believe OU's most talented five has Caden Green at one guard and Savion Bird at the other. And I understand that Caleb Schaefer is a captain for this game. And I expect him to play at right guard. I do. But if it was up to me, I would start Caden Green at left guard, and I would start Savion Bird at right guard. Because you've had a couple weeks now with the bye, you've had some time to get Savion more comfortable flipping sides. Caden Green, he's a true freshman. He's been working at left guard. So it probably makes the most sense for him to not flip, right? It makes more sense for a guy who's been in the system longer to flip over to the other side. But, Ted, that's what I would do. I, I'm not sure what it's going to look like on Saturday, but if it were up to me, that's what it would look like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least there's some options to play with. You know, Caden Green at left. Um, uh, Savion maybe play some right. You may get, what, Troy Everett. Uh, play some left as well behind I Caden and – Schaefer at right behind Bird. Troy Everett's future is at center. Yeah. I think I think you get Savion Bird and and Caden Green reps at guard. Now, and I've said it before, I think I think Troy Everett's going to be a good center. 
down the line at Oklahoma. But there are better options at guard, in my opinion. So that's that's what the O-line would look like on Saturday. The first O-line, I think they're going to play multiple guys. But the O-line would be Rouse, Green, Rain, Bird, Guyton. I'd like and when that. you think about that, how that lineup's going to look, start getting real excited. Yeah, I'd like that. I, if, if if Savion Burr can go out and play four quarters of football at a high level, stay locked in mentally, and I honestly, it's what we need. It's it's one of the things that we've been missing is that size, explosiveness, um, you know little bit of anger there on the interior so I, i'd love to see it yeah i do think oh you can find success in the run game i am convinced i've talked myself into it ted this is the week the chunk runs come yes my, my bold prediction on monday night at Rudy's was that they would have three runs of 30 plus yards i heard that I, I think they can do it because when when you watch the tape, I think the zone game is good, right, in the variations. I, I think the counter stuff is really good uh, against that UCF front. They do not do a job a good job, in my opinion, of, you know, kind of playing across guys' face in the gap scheme stuff. They kind of just sit there and get blocked. But – I am interested in seeing how much outside zone we see from Oklahoma. I, I thought we saw some decent stuff in those concepts against Texas. And you watch UCF's defensive line. They get reached, I mean, incredibly easily. So I believe it's due. I believe the team is due. The big chunk runs are coming on Saturday, baby. Let's go. I can't wait. I cannot wait. I think uh I think everyone's probably with me on that. And yeah, I think I I think it it sets up really nicely. I kind of said the same thing. My bold prediction is that we outrush UCF, who is I think third in the country right now, running the football at like two hundred and forty five yards a game or, or so. So yeah, we need a big day running the football because I think once you once you kind of break out and start to have some success, feels like it it can become contagious and and kind of carry for the rest of the season, get some momentum going. Yeah, a few more run game thoughts. How much QB run game are we going to see with Dylan Gabriel? A lot. We we saw quite a bit against Texas, but that's Texas. Is UCF the type of team? Is this the type of matchup where Levy feels the need to call Dylan's number a lot or put him in the situations in the RPO game or in the read game where he's carrying it? Because I certainly think they can have a lot of success if they want to do it. UCF seems to lose track of the quarterback in some of those read concepts. Go watch the Kansas State game. But is it something OU needs to do in this game, right? We saw him crank it up against Texas. I, I don't know. Is that the new thought process on offense, or was that, hey, Texas is a really talented team. We need to get to more plus one runs in the QB run game. I, I don't know, but I'm interested to find out on Saturday. I think the Texas game was, hey, this is Texas. We're going to – we're going to have to find an edge somewhere to run the ball against that big defensive line. And you won the game. Now, do you need it against UCF? No, you don't. But there's something interesting that came out of that win against Texas. That's your Heisman odds. Mm. Dylan Gabriel, all of a sudden, is kind of right there knocking on the door with a group of other guys, a small group of other guys. Um, I think this is, I think you start padding the stats. If you don't think that teams do that when, it, because a Heisman is incredibly valuable for a program in recruiting, in marketing, in everything. 
And now that he's right there, what is he third in the Heisman odds right now? Yeah. Um, wouldn't shock me if they do- start dialing him up a lot. How about this compromise? You dial it up when you're getting close to the end zone. Yeah. The rushing yards for a quarterback, they are what they are. It's all about that total touchdowns number. The payoff, yep. The payoff. So maybe maybe we could come to a compromise. Red zone run threat in this one for Dylan Gabriel. We'll see. But what I do know is you have to make UCF's defensive backs get off blocks and tackle. If I were Jeff Lebby, and I hate picking on individual guys like this, but it just, I saw it over and over again on tape. You come up with every formation under the sun to try to get number 10, Quadric Bullard, into the run fit. Kansas did it. They went nub tight in into the boundary. Ted, and that did the trick. He's there one-on-one with running backs, with Highshaw just getting steamrolled. Mm. And I, I would... I mean, he's light. They need to attack him and get him into the fit. I know Levy will do it. I just hope he does it a lot because I do not think that guy wants to come downhill and make tackles. I just, I do not see that when I watch it on tape. The first, they may do it the first running play. They should. They should line up Tawi Walker, get 10 into the run fit and say, all right, Good luck. It's going to be, does this look familiar to you? Here it comes. Yeah. Yeah. And because you want him thinking about that all game. And once that happens, your mind starts to wonder a little bit, and then you're exposed to a bunch of other stuff. Some past game thoughts. Interested to see what UCF's coverage mentality is in this game. I don't think they are a very good zone coverage team. I think they struggle, especially at the linebacker position, uh, relating and underneath zone coverage. Uh, I think there's a lot of money to be made there in the middle of the field by a guy like Drake Stoops, Jalil Farouk. But I I just don't think they can sit back in a two-shell and not get gashed by OU's run game. So I'm expecting UCF to say, hey, you know what? Let's be aggressive. And their corners, their corners press quite a bit on the outside. So here's something that's that's going to be important. OU's wide receivers got to play really physically in this game. Farouk, especially on the outside, right? Because they're going to get some press man. And it's just not something you see a ton of week in and week out. So Farouk, Nick Anderson, Jaden Gibson. Those guys on the outside, they're going to have to be really good with their releases off the line of scrimmage. And if they make those guys miss with their hands, there there are some big plays in the vertical passing game to be had. Big, huge, huge plays. And we had Emmett Jones on Coach's Corner a couple weeks ago, and something he said really stood out to me. He said he wants his wide receivers playing with a linebacker mentality. That that's what they need to bring to this game because these corners for UCF, they are going to be up in their face at the line of scrimmage and they are going to grab them like crazy. And you can't let them grab it, right? You can't put it in the officials' hands. You have to get their hands off of you. And if you do that, I'm telling you, man, some big plays down the sidelines to be had. Yeah, especially if they've got to get aggressive in the box, like like you were talking about, slanting the front, adding pressure, bringing backers, bringing safeties. Um, yeah, there should be some big opportunities if you can beat some of that some of that tight coverage whenever they're pressed up. W- do you expect Nick Anderson to be the guy that gets to fill in the the Andrew Anthony hole? Yes, I, I think that. I mean, he's just so he's shown so much. Right now, what is it? 11 catches with six touchdowns, which is just insane. But when the ball hasn't come his way, and and I watch for stuff like that when I'm going back through the tape, reviewing the game, he's a really crisp route runner. 
got speed. He's got explosiveness. Just the ball hasn't found him a ton. And I, I think the ball is going to find him more. And now you got to have Jaden Gibson step up, Brennan Thompson, right? Interested to see when you got a guy with speed like that, you use him, right? <laughs> Obviously, yep. you use him. But I think Anderson has earned that role. Now he's going to have to continue each and every day on the practice field, each and every week to earn that role. That's that's how Emmett Jones operates. That's how Jeff Levy operates. But, yeah, I think that – I don't know. I would be surprised if he doesn't run out there with the first group. Is that is that how you feel? Yeah. No, I, I would be surprised. I think it's just, you know, kind of the pecking order that we've seen. Um, you had your starters. Nick Anderson was the guy that was – Next, getting the most reps, and then Jaden Gibson was after that, and then we just started to see Brennan Thompson. So I would expect Nick Anderson to get starter reps, Jaden Gibson to have an increased role as a as a guy that spells or comes in. He's he's been a guy down in the red zone that they've brought in, and then as long as he's healthy and ready to go, I do expect to see Brennan Thompson out there as well so yeah uh, nick anderson should get the bulk of that yeah the the only other thought i have on no use passing game in this in this matchup i'm sorry number 10 but attack him and here's why anytime i see a defensive back on tape wearing a bulky ish knee brace i'm attacking him vertically man it, it's like it it might as well be just a red blinking light. <laughs> just at, you got to test it. Right. So, yeah, I realize I've said, hey, pick on him in the run game, make him be in the fit and attack him in the vertical passing game. Yeah, I I think you try to ruin number 10's day. That's where I'm at. I think he's the weak link back in, in the back end of that defense. Yeah. And and you can. Uh... Like when you were talking about attacking him in the run game, I uh, you can do some things to get him thinking about that, and then get the matchup you want off of it, and and be able to expose it. I uh, I think that that's a I think that's a good game plan, and I'm sure we'll see it out there. He's you better prove you can run with that contraption on your leg, right? Uh, or else it's gonna be a long day. Yeah. All right. Let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys for the number one thing. You'll be watching for an OU UCF. This first one comes from Monty Cisco, who says UCF is in the top five in rushing nationally. So I'll be paying attention to the front seven in regards to stopping UCF's run game. I also want to see if we can establish the run against that team after watching Kansas run for 399. I'll be disappointed if we don't rush for 250 plus. I I think that's a pretty fair assessment. From our man Monty Ted. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think honestly, I feel like the back when you look at the front half of the schedule, SMU had a good solid defensive front. Um, Cincinnati had a really good solid defensive front. Texas had a really good solid defensive front. We know how good Iowa State's defense is. I we faced some good defenses early on that's going to trail off a little bit here over the next couple of games. And I fully expect our offensive numbers to increase um, now that it's going to be not quite as talented in the front seven. Yeah. This other one comes from at the boys forever who says, I'd like to see Tawi get the carries like he's the number one and give him a chance to get some kind of rhythm going. I don't know if, the bye week will change how they operate at the running back position. Ted, we, you know, after that Texas game, we came on here and said that, hey, it looks like Tawi Walker is the best running back this team has. But I absolutely has ha- have given up on this offense establishing some, you know, bell cow back. I just, I, I'm going to need to see that before I believe it. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad team, right? You're winning games. And it seems like guys are going to stay fresh as a result of the way that DeMarco Murray's been doing it. Yeah. 
I, I fully expect it to be Marcus Major and Tawi Walker handle, handling the bulk of the carries. Now, uh, things can change depending on what the game looks like. Um, but I think those two guys are going to get 90% of the carries unless you find yourself in blowout territory or something like that. And, you know, your other younger backs are going to get a chance to come in there. I, until I see differently, it's Tawi Walker, Marcus Major, in my opinion. 